Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here uh, at the Woods Hole Research Centre. Many thanks to Melissa for organising this, and it's great to see such a good turnout. Uh, I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes, and, and then my three colleagues will come and uh, give, give a, a brief presentation for about five minutes each, and then we'll all sit here and be very happy to take any questions uh, you have of us. What I'm going to do is explain to you what we mean by this term primary forests, uh, say something about their values, why are they valuable to us, and um, the benefits they provide, and say something about the, the, the threats to their ecosystem integrity. A and then I'll stop because my three colleagues are, are going to give you some of the solutions that are needed to protect them, uh, including examples of, uh, of what's working in the world today <coughs> and something about what we need to be doing. Well, <coughs> this might be obvious, but uh, uh, it's not as obvious as what you might think. There are many kinds of forests. We use the word forest to actually cover a huge range of natural phenomena Obviously, uh, uh, what they have in common is that they have trees. But as uh, everyone here, I'm sure, is fully aware, there are forests and there are forests. So when we say primary forests, we're really talking about natural forests, forests that have come about as a result of natural processes to do with ecology, ecological processes and, and processes of biological evolution and the interaction between living organisms and the physical environment. And that's a scene of a primary forest in the Brazilian Amazon, uh, where, where Barb is working. And uh, the, the image on the right, you can see there's a person there, is a, is a mountain ash forest uh, in, in the central highlands of the state of Victoria and Australia, which has a lot of ecological similarities with the tall, wet forests of the Pacific coast of USA and Canada. Uh, so these forests, um, you know, humans, uh, in, in, in all of these forests actually, humans have been living in them since there have been humans. Uh, and, but the forests, uh, they, they all have an ancient origin um, and of course predate humans. So they are not in any respect reliant upon or dependent upon humans for their, for their, for their generation or regeneration. Um, and we can compare that to what I can just put simply as degraded forests. These are forests that have been heavily utilised and exploited by humans um, to extract stuff from them, mainly the wood, but often they're cleared to get into what's underneath them in the way of mineral exploration, etc. So uh, about a third of the world's forests uh, that currently exist are uh, are degraded by these kind of intensive industrial scale you know, commercial activities. Uh, and then we also have what uh, some people call them secondary forests to distinguish them from primary forests, but, but they're forests that are regrowing from having been either completely, uh, um, you know, or put it this way, severely degraded, if not, if, if not completely deforested, a long time ago, and of course, we're looking at that, that category of forest here out through this window, and this whole section of, uh, of northeast you know, United States, as I'm sure you all know this history far better than I do, was cleared for agriculture and cattle and sheep a long time ago for various, various reasons uh, that farmland was abandoned, and, and the forest has regrown largely from the remaining seed stock that was present. And this was a very interesting paper that was done by some American ecologists um, back in 2013 where they were able to study at a large number of sites um, across these states um, uh, what the, they were able to reconstruct what the, what the taxonomic composition of the forest was, what, what species of forest trees were there be, before they were cleared and what's grown back. And you can see there's a, it's colour coded and you can see there's a difference in the colours. On the right hand side it's kind of dark, dark reds and on the, on the right hand side it's kind of light pinks and light reds. Well what's changed, you've still got a forest, uh, it's still technically the same kind of forest except what's different? Well, 
the uh, forest as it was was dominated by, by um, late successional taxa such as beech and hemlock and, and now it's, you know, it's all dominated by kind of early, more pioneer species such as red maple. So if you like, it's kind of a teenage forest, right? It's yet to grow to maturity. It's not, it's not yet a middle-aged forest, let alone a kind of wise and mature one like the speakers before you today, <laughs> um, so to speak. So, uh, so again, a lot, of, a, a lot of the world's forests that we see are, are kind of baby forests. And, and actually, a lot of the human land use, um, intensive land use and commercial land use, actually keeps them young, actually prevent them from growing into some kind of ecological maturity. And then, of course, there are uh, what are referred to as plantations or planted forests. These are forests which are entirely the design and, the, um, and at the instigation of and are only maintained by, by humans. They require huge amounts of inputs from humans of all kinds, from, from, from the seeds or the seedlings through to fertilisers and pesticides and insecticides. And they're grown generally in, in monocultures. There's one species and it's grown specifically to produce a commodity or a raw material that feeds into some kind of industrial process. So on the left we've got palm, palm oil and on the right we've got Pinus radiata which was the poor thing. It was a lovely little native species of west coast USA, maybe up, I'm not quite sure what elevation, up, up a bit. It wasn't a coastal species. Had a very narrow range but a forest has got to and bred it up and it's now you know, one of the two or three commercial species that's grown uh, around the world um, uh, you know, in, 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 uh, for industrial production of, of woody fibre. Now, uh, what's happened... I should keep an eye on the time, shouldn't I? Um, when did I start? Like, <laughs> how many more minutes do I have to go? <laughs> Ten minutes, OK. Um, so why is this difference important? I mean, we can see the difference, you can understand in general terms the difference. Why is the difference important? Well, it, it matters, the difference between these types of forests matters because these forests vary, they are all forests, if you like, but they vary in their characteristics, the values, um, and the benefits they provide people and the planet. So I'm just going to give some uh, examples of each of those differencing differentiating values and benefits. Well, the first one, and this is, this is the really interesting one, and the one that's actually, you know, grabs a lot of attention, is that they store, primary forests store a lot more carbon than what do degraded, recovering or plantation forests. And there's a very simple explanation for it, and that is, if you look out the window at a tree, uh, take out the, imagine removing all the water, 50% uh, of what you're looking at is carbon. Right? So, uh, uh, and, and mo so most of the carbon that's in a forest is stored in the woody biomass of large old trees. I mean, that's just the simple, in the stems and in the roots. And depending on the species, it can also be in the, there's a lot of the branches as well. So, of course, when we commercially log a forest, um, that's the first, the first cut takes out the big trees and, uh, and successive cuts uh, keep the forest at a young age and never allow the big trees to grow. So, uh, so there's a range, it depends upon, depends upon the forest ecosystem type and the, and the logging regime and the logging cycle, etc. But you know, basically, they, primary forests just store a hell of a lot more carbon than, than, than any other forest types that we're talking about. So why is that important? Well, gosh, I'd really like to give a talk about where carbon came from and how Earth is a closed system and all the carbon that's here was, you know, here when Earth was formed um, and it's not going anywhere. Earth doesn't leak any carbon. So the, carbon, the carbon's here to stay but, but it can take various forms. So this is a graph, it's my only graph um, and the vertical column is the uh, stock of carbon in these major um, reservoirs in the Earth system. That's petagrams of carbon which is equivalent to a billion, one petagram of carbon is a one billion metric tons of carbon. If you're interested. So we're looking at how much carbon is in known conventional gas deposits 
known oil deposits, known, known coal deposits in the atmosphere and, and, and in terrestrial ecosystems and 80% of that's in forests. Um, how does carbon get around? Well, you know, carbon is an is a, is a element and it, and it can form different kinds of molecules so it can take a different form. When it's in the atmosphere, it's, it's, it's a gas, right? Um, you know, here obviously it's a solid. Uh, there's actually a huge amount in the ocean, but I don't have time to talk about the ocean story, but obviously it's a dissolved inorganic form in the ocean. But in plants it's taken up through photosynthesis and it's actually stored, um, well what's woody biomass made of? It's uh, carbohydrates, it's sugars essentially. It's the carbon found in sugars. Well if the carbon's not here, it's got to go somewhere and the atmosphere doesn't leak carbon dioxide. So if the carbon's not here, it's here. Right? Um, there's also a link to the oceans, but we'll leave that out for the moment. So the, the reason why we've got a climate change, a climate crisis, is because we're digging up this and oxidising it, and, 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 and the oxidised coal goes into the, the oxidised carbon that was in the coal when it's burnt goes in the atmosphere. And when we, when we log and, and destroy trees, forest ecosystems, that biomass carbon also gets oxidised and become carbon dioxide. So, and primary forests store 30 to 70 percent more coal, more carbon than, than other forest types. Well, if it's not in the primary forest, where is it? Well, it's in the atmosphere. And so what we have to do is, to address the climate change crisis, is to avoid emissions. So how do we avoid emissions? We stop using coal and oil and gas and we avoid um, logging and degrading primary forests. Uh, primary forests, of course, are also really important for, uh, for biodiversity and they provide unique wildlife habitat that's not found in any other forest type. And this is a, um, an example from Australia, from these mountain ash forests uh, I, I showed you a photo of before. And this is Leadbeater's possum, which is a threatened uh, uh, listed threatened, one of Australia's most endangered um, 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 marsupial mammals. So Leadbeater's possum can only survive because of large old trees and these large old trees after about 150 years they start to hollow out in the middle through, through fungi and, 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 and other, kind of, um, other kind of activities and so the possum nests and shelters in the hollows of these large old trees and they actually spend about 16 hours a day in there. They're very lazy animals. So. Uh, it, it's, it's actually a thermoregulation thing. In winter they have to stay in there or they'll freeze to this. And they also reproduce in there and the kind of hollow they, um, they shelter in and nest in protects them from predators. So basically if there's no large old trees there's no leadbeater's possum. And actually the reason why it's one of Australia's most threatened Actually, it's one of the world's most threatened mammals, uh, species, is because um, these are almost all gone. There's only 1% only of the original primary forest in Mount Nash remains. The rest has been um, intensively uh, uh, felled and logged for, 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 to produce wood chips. Okay. So, so this turns into a pile of wood chip, which is sold to Japan, which is turned into a cardboard box. Um, which, is then, which is then shipped back to Australia when we buy a fridge or refrigerator or a washing machine and then that gets thrown in the dump. So uh, there are many, many, many of our wildlife species that are, that are dependent upon habitat, habitat um, features and, and, and characteristics that are only found in primary forests. Primary forests are also incredibly important for water supply uh, because they yield a, 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 for, a, a watershed uh, covered in a primary forest yields the cleanest water. I mean, it's easy to understand that. As soon as you start logging it, you cause soil erosion and you increase the sediment flow and so the water gets, gets um, all mucky. Uh, so so from, a, from a water supply point of view, you want the clean water and that's what it does. And also, and this is, um, has certainly been definitively proved in the tropics, a large extent of primary forest affects the regional climate and that's because the primary forest, um, the plants are using so much water, they're evaporating water, so there's more water vapour going up into the atmosphere, 
what goes up must come down, uh, so they va evaporate more water, less runs out through the streams. So there's more water vapour in the atmosphere, so there's more rainfall. And this has been shown in Africa, about 30% of the rain that falls on the, on the Amazon rainforest comes from the water that's been evaporated from the rainforest. The rainforest is actually helping create the climate that the rainforest needs. It's an incredible, what we call, positive feedback. But they're under massive threat, uh, and you know, we all know the reasons why they contain valuable timber, uh, and they are being uh, rapidly... Um, uh, 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 I'm trying to think of a... A nice word, but annihilated is probably the. They're, be, they're being they're being targeted, you know, for for by uh, in, for, by industrial scale, you know, commodity related industries. They're being turned into wood chip and other things. Um, uh, uh, this uh, is not the, this is a deforestation for growing cows, not in Brazil, but in Australia. Australia loses about four hundred thousand hectares of forest every year. Uh, uh, for, for growing cows, exactly like in Brazil. Uh, <coughs> and uh, so we're taking trees like that and, uh, and this is illegal logging um, in Brazil, which Barb will say something about shortly. So what can be done about this? Um, what can we do to um, get the values of primary forests and the benefits they provide people um, recognised and, and properly valued? And, and what kind of responses can we put in place internationally and nationally and locally to make sure that these forests are protected so they can continue to provide the benefits that they do? Well, at that point I'm going to stop and hand over to my colleagues who's going to give you some good news about what good things are happening in some parts of our world. Hi. Well, so we have five minutes each to give you the solutions to all this. <laughs> I'm going to really try to do this quickly. But one of the solutions that does work, where it can be applied, and where I think the conservation movement is increasingly sort of putting their hope into, is working with local forest communities, whether they be indigenous or other local communities that are living beside or possibly in these forests, and it's their home and they're um, gaining a large part of all of, or s at least some of their livelihoods uh, from these forests, but they're often, well, almost always the, you know, the weaker, financially anyway, members of their national societies, so they don't usually have much of a voice, and when the industry and the corporations move in, the, in there, they're usually pretty much, you know, pushed out. So. The conservation movement has realized, and uh, we have good examples to show that it works, that empowering these local people um, to, to really to defend their, their rights it, uh, also works for conservation, and that it's a great a method that we have um, to preserve some large tracts of, in this case, what a, the example I'm going to tell you really quickly about is in the Brazilian Amazon, in the southeastern Amazon, which is being one of the world's highest deforestation zones, deforestation for ranching principally, but also mining and dam building and road building and soybean. And this is this um, satellite shot shows you an indigenous territory, which is the green block, surrounded by ranches and soybean and roads and logging and everything else you can imagine, but it's still intact. And the reason in 2019 um, that uh, that territory is still intact is because NGOs, non-governmental organizations, have allied with the indigenous owners of this territory, um, the traditional indigenous peoples who live and have rights to this territory to help them understand the outside world that they're now surrounded by and how to defend themselves in that outside world. And um, it's proving to be very effective. In this case, this is just one case, but it's a striking case because of the size of the area 
these people who are called the Kayapo uh, have an area, this, this green area that belongs to them is the size of South Korea. It's um, over 11 million hectares. Actually, that entire area is more like 14 million hectares, but the Kayapo occupy the, the top part. So extremely significant for uh, rainforest conservation in a really difficult part of the world where um, deforestation is increasing at a more rapid pace, again, for the same industrial reasons that we all know, and uh, where there's also little law enforcement. So although these people do have rights to this land, the government doesn't enforce it, and the ranchers, the loggers, the gold miners, everybody else uh, just will go in there if they can get in there. So uh, what we have been doing is working with them to help them defend their rights and uh, investing in all sorts of programs. And it's, it's effective. So even in this scenario of high deforestation and lawlessness, that block of green primary forests survives. So that's one way that we can um, that we can uh, save some of these primary forests, which are you know the greatest stocks of of terrestrial carbon and biodiversity and species of plants and animals, and uh, and also indigenous cultures. Now, of course, their fight is to save their home and their livelihoods and the basis of their cultures, right? We are more, uh, you know, want to save the forest for the reasons that everybody in this room knows. But the two objectives are 100% are the same. And that's how we're able to form this alliance, in this case, with these people that's uh, been really effective at, um, at saving, so far, a very large area of, of rainforest in the Brazilian Amazon. Although... You know the never, no, nothing. You you never can you can never rest in this business. And without getting into it, Brazil has just elected a very difficult uh, new president who wants to remove indigenous land rights and open their lands up to industry. That's a story for another day. But we'll keep we'll keep fighting. And I I don't think these these people are going to quit anytime soon. And the point is the outside investment investment in them and helping them to understand and deal in the outside world has been really effective at protecting this huge area of primary forest. And this is a model that, it, I mean, this isn't the only place in, in, in forest where um, organizations have worked with local peoples for, for uh, protection. The point is it, it does work. Uh, my name is Cyril Cormos. Thanks everyone for coming. I'm. Uh, just started a brand new NGO in, uh, in November called Wild Heritage. It's based out of Earth Island Institute in Berkeley, California. Um, and it's my great privilege to work with this uh, great crowd of, of people that you've, uh, you've just seen speaking. Um, and um, I focus on primary forest conservation and world heritage sites, and I'll tell you a little bit about, a little bit about both. Um, you would think, having heard Brendan and Barb's presentations and understanding that primary forests represent this remarkable convergence of species diversity, high carbon stocks, fresh water provision, fresh water quality, cultural diversity, linguistic diversity, etc., that everybody would be falling all over themselves, particular NGOs and civil society, to generate a, a clear, strong, powerful focus on the importance of primary forest conservation. Unfortunately, that hasn't been the case. Um, you do see, obviously, a lot of NGOs that are very focused on old growth. Um, you see them regionally, you see them in every country. But there was no international movement, there was no network, there was no coalition trying to give primary forests, old growth forests, a voice in international policy. And a number of us, of course, like-minded people were working very closely together, uh, Virginia, Brendan, Barb, myself, others. But we found ourselves drowned out a lot. It was very difficult to get above the background noise. It was really difficult to get primary forests a voice. So we founded a coalition called International Action for Primary Forests, INTACT. Um, and uh, INTACT uh, has a website, which is primaryforest.org, and about 100 organizations have signed up. 
um, and we're sort of taking on the very difficult task of being sort of the champions for, for primary force in international policy, which is trying to explain to people um, that you know, in the climate convention, in the biodiversity convention, and other policy mechanisms, that this is a critical convergence point that we need to do uh, much more to, to pay attention to. And unfortunately, sadly, you know, that's an uphill battle. Um, <clears throat> I think we are making progress. We are getting a lot more attention, and that's very, very encouraging. But it's, it's been hard work. And, and sadly, um, you know, oftentimes, the hardest work is convincing our own colleagues in civil society that this is an important issue. <laughs> so um, that's why this, this meeting has been incredibly encouraging, because being able to be here at Woods Hole with Woods Hole scientists and with you know, the people we've been working with over the last few years to give a really strong, sharp focus to this issue has been, has been a real boost. So um, we're very happy about that. Um, one solution um, from a policy standpoint that I'm particularly involved in um, uh, also at the international level is the World Heritage Convention. Um, and very quickly, that convention is focused essentially on protecting the best places on Earth, uh, the most important cultural sites, the most important natural sites, places that are what we call of outstanding universal value. Um, and a kind of a, a litmus test for what that means is that you would walk into a forest or into a building, a church, or a you know, a historical building, and immediately understand that the significance goes way beyond that particular local place, that particular country, that particular region, it matters to everybody. Um, on the natural side, we're talking about the Virungas, the Yosemites, the Galapagos, the Great Barrier Reef, um, the really iconic, extraordinary places that really matter and that absolutely must be protected. Um, the good news is that that convention has been very active on primary forests, even though it hasn't really done so explicitly in the name of primary forests. Um, it has and continues to protect some of the greatest, last and greatest big forest wilderness areas left on the planet. Um, just last year, uh, you know, the, Col the Colombian president made it his personal legacy on his way out to uh, uh, nominate Chiribiquete National Park in Colombia, three million hectares of, of very pristine Amazonian forest. Uh, it's sort of a convergence point between the Andes and the Amazon, the lowlands, the Guyana Shield, uh, tabletop mountains, extremely high in biodiversity. Some of the last uncontacted tribes in the Amazon are there. Um, the most spectacular rock art in the world. It's a really, it's a lost world. It's a spectacular place. Um, in Russia, there was an initiative to protect some of the last tiger, tiger habitat in, in uh, in the central Sikhote Alin uh, uh, National Park and World Heritage Site that was expanded by another million hectares. Uh, in Canada, we had First Nations um, protecting three million hectares. It was a First Nations-led initiative to protect three million hectares in Pamachuanaki. Um, four First Nations coming together and deciding that they were going to protect their cultural heritage and their forests um, through the World Heritage Convention. So. I work with IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Um, I represent World Heritage um, through their World Commission on Protected Areas. And what I'm trying to do is to, is to use this mechanism to leverage um, you know, large-scale protection of some of the best places on Earth, and in particular, some of the last big primary forests. So that organization is called Wild Heritage, wild-heritage.org. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's brand new and uh, looking to scale up. So thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, I work in the international policy space as part of the Griffith University team looking at how you deliver good science to decision makers, which is an extremely challenging task, particularly um, in the international sphere with some of these big conventions that are very difficult um, for even scientists to access, let alone the community. Um, it's been an interesting and challenging learning experience for me, but it, it's very clear that if we had more engagement from the community and more understanding about how some of these international rules impact what happens to forests even here, um, we could build a groundswell of support for change. Um, one of the things some of you might be aware is because of the way the international rules relate to forests, we now have a whole new industry of burning forests for power. And the forests of Southeast America 
are at the forefront of that, where something like, I think you'll correct me, Peter, if I'm wrong, but I think it's about 8 million tonnes a year of wood pellets produced from swamp forests and old growth forests and some planted forests out of southeastern US are uh, chopped up. I mean, the, the, the landscape's annihilated. Chopped up, turned into pellets uh, and shipped to Europe and the UK. There, the... Uh, and this industry is only possible because of international rules that allow Europe to claim that this energy is carbon neutral and renewable. In fact, it's more emissive per unit of energy than coal and it's anything but renewable when you're talking about old forests and natural forests that are on wetlands and, um, you know, in many cases quite ancient forests that are in fact irreplaceable. So that's an example of why the international rules are important and there are a few other folks, including Peter Riggs at the back, who's at the forefront of trying to get um, this system of rules changed. There is increasing awareness globally and a strong pushback from the science community about the insanity, of the climate and biodiversity insanity of chopping down safely stored carbon in landscapes and putting it immediately into the atmosphere and no one counting the emissions. And the Europeans are actually being sued by a number of plaintiffs and the chief scientist is a, an American woman called Mary Booth with the Partnership for Policy Integrity. She has pulled this case together. Um, and <laughs> are they're being sued because of their refusal to actually treat this you know, resource honestly in terms of its impact on, on nature and its impact on the climate. Um, and change is slowly happening in that arena and the science community is really up in arms about the absurdity of the whole venture. The other um, increasing area of interest and relevance in the international sphere is the realisation that we don't just have a climate crisis, we have a biodiversity crisis and that the two things are linked. So we have a circular relationship, if you like, between climate and biodiversity and ecosystem integrity. As you damage ecosystems by removing elements of biodiversity and degrade it, it's more vulnerable to losing its carbon stocks. The ecosystem's less stable, you release carbon into the atmosphere, the less stable the ecosystem, the more easily damaged it is by things like climate change. So, so the, the circular relationship works two ways. Um, the good news is that if you protect biodiversity and restore ecosystem integrity, you actually improve the stability of your ecosystem carbon stocks. And the first morning we, we turned up here and we had a lovely presentation, wonderful, from Bill Moomore, um, who talked about something we've been talking about in the project for quite some time, which, and he's got a new term for it called proforestation. And that is encouraging degraded natural forests to reach their full potential to let them grow old, to let them store as much carbon as they're able to store. Um, and you do that in a way that buffers and reconnects areas of primary forests that helps build the resilience of those forests and their resistance to threats, whether that's pest, disease, fire, drought, or climate change itself. So that was a very encouraging introduction to our seminar. So the... the the move internationally now is to try and integrate the workings of the Biodiversity Convention and the Climate Convention, at least in relation to land and forests. And an ideal outcome would be that all climate action in land and forests helps protect biodiversity and ensures ecosystem integrity. So that is, in fact, one of the goals of the project we're working in. Thank you. I'll have a question for our colleague from Brisbane. What kinds of understanding and cooperation are you <coughs> finding from other uh, surrounding countries, from uh, Southeast Asia? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. So it's, uh, it's highly variable, if you like. Um, interestingly, Indonesia, which gets a lot of bad press because of um, the extensive 
conversion of, of, of natural forest to, plant to um, palm oil plantations and the like, uh, you know, uh, they've actually just uh, uh, extended uh, uh, a moratorium on, on lo any logging or intrusion into, into the remaining primary forest. So uh, it's quite a turnaround, I think. Um, there's a, you know, Indonesia is a big country, it's got a huge population and, and these issues are as contested within Indonesian society as they are anywhere else. But you know, they've, they've, they, at the moment they've, they've made this very strong um, policy commitment uh, you know, to, to allow no further degradation of primary forests. You go across the border into Papua New Guinea uh, and it's, it's not so clear um, but again, they, you know, they, the, the government does recognise primary forests. But again, it's a different context. So in uh, Indonesia, all the forest is owned by the central government. Right? Papua New Guinea, the, the central government owns none of the forests. It's all the land and the resources are customarily owned by the traditional tribal groups. And that's in their constitution. So the government just can't tell the customary owners what to do, these things have to be, the, the customary owners have a lot of, you know, a lot of say in what happens to their forest. So, um, and it's patchy. Some communities are like the Kaipo, others um, have been convinced otherwise. So, uh, but as we go north through Southeast Asia, it's not a very happy story. Um, in, in uh, uh, you know, the, the, rem the remaining primary forests in Southeast Asia are really being hammered, um, you know, hard and fast, and there is not the awareness of the values of those forests as there is actually in Indonesia and, um, you know, the understanding and, and, and debates within societies in Indonesia and Papua New Guinea is much, at a much higher level than what it is elsewhere in, in Southeast Asia. Well, my name is George Masters Woodwell. And I have a hard time not pontificating on that topic. But I think it would be unfortunate if we left here without a good, firm understanding of the role that forests have in the global carbon cycle, the role they have in curing the climatic disruption that we are facing at the moment. So I'd ask you to elaborate on that topic. Yeah, well, I'll let me let me begin. So um, there are two roles that forests can play. One is uh, 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 forests store carbon. So uh, uh, primary forests, kind of by definition, are at their natural carbon carrying capacity. So one thing we can do is avoid emissions by by not um, having human induced emissions. So talk about that that's. Uh, okay, well, uh, as I said, there's about eight, well, there's a, uh, it, uh, about, well, just let me answer the question in two ways. So, first of all, there are about a third of the world's forests that are left are primary forests, and, and there's a third which are used for commercial logging, so their carbon stocks are very low, and there's a third which are, which are hi just highly degraded, you know, they're not really functional, functionally forests at all. So, so there's, two, there's two mitigation actions you can take. One, one is to uh, um, protect primary forests so they don't, we don't emit all the carbon that's in them. The other is to allow the, um, the logged and degraded forest to regrow naturally. So, so the question is, what, if we were to do that in an ideal world, if we were to, um, uh, let's say, if we were just to allow all the world's remaining natural forests to continue to be logged and cleared this century. So if we were to have complete deforestation of the world's natural forests by the end of this century, that would increase the atmospheric concentration of CO2 by at least 100 parts per million. It's currently at 400. Okay? To limit global warming to 2 degrees above pre-industrial levels, it can get up maybe to 450 parts per million. So if we were to um, completely stop using fossil fuel tomorrow, but allow the complete deforestation of the world's natural forests this century, you know, we would still be, we would still be way, way over two degrees and heading into three degree territory. So that, that in, you know, 
in, you know, it's, that's some indication of the potential contribution that forests can play, but you might want to say some more about that. Yeah, so on, a, on an annual basis, this is the year all the time, is the emissions, carbon emissions from deforestation and degradation of forests is about 8% of annual emissions. Um, what is hidden in that statistic is that is in fact a net figure. In other words, they're measuring what goes up in the atmosphere and a portion of which is also reabsorbed by forest. The gross figure of how much is actually emitted by clearing forests and degraded forests is much higher. We don't know exactly what, what that percentage could be. I've seen the figure 8 to 20 percent as a very broad range. But the point is a, a lot of the carbon that we emit every year is coming from forests and from primary forests. And a lot of that is, is in fact, unnecessary. And as Brendan said, the, the scale of the problem and the scale of the carbon stock is so big that if we emit even a fraction of the, of the carbon in primary forests, uh, it doesn't really matter if we get off of fossil fuels and transition to renewables. There is enough, many times over, just in forests, without all the other terrestrial ecosystems, without you know, looking at uh, you know, wetlands and, and seagrasses and other ecosystems around the world, there's plenty in forests to drive us to a very unsafe climate very quickly. Um, so <coughs> if you start restoring those forests and you start drawing the, atmosphere, uh, the atmospheric carbon down, and if you allow those forests to age, as Brendan said, then in fact, forests are not only part of the solution, they're an essential part of the solution. Um, we do not solve the climate crisis without forests. Um, so it, it's, you know, it's, we need to reduce emissions from every sector. But, you know, it's not an either or thing. We need to, we need to reduce the, the carbon emissions from fossil fuel use and we need to protect the vast carbon stock, keep that out of the atmosphere, and we need to restore so that the aging forests can pull the carbon out of the atmosphere. And unfortunately, there's this perception that an old forest just kind of keels over and you know, stops being productive and releases all the carbon and that you know, they all, all the trees die and it's all dead wood and it's a huge problem and we, at all costs, must have young forests. And that's a big, big fallacy. What we're finding out is that a lot of trees, as they age, continue to sequester just as much carbon, and in some cases, even more. And it's a function of the trunk size, it's a function of the branches, it's a function of the leaf size. Um, but there's been a, a kind of a myth that, that the tree gets old, falls over, and that you're better off cutting it before it falls over, because once it falls over, it's useless. Um, and so we're desperately trying to get this message out that, you know, the stock that's there in the old, resilient, strong, biodiverse forest needs to be protected, and the stock that, the, the forests that are young and, and growing fast need to help us pull the, the carbon out of the atmosphere. And that that's not a bonus, that's not a co-benefit, that's essential, we have to do it. If we don't do both, that and fossil fuels, we don't have a safe climate. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Pranayala, I work for Education for Sustainable Development uh, over the last year. And I was just wondering, uh, I fully concur on the importance of uh, uh, you know, having governments and civil society in the policy dialogue to protect the, the world heritage sites and the national heritage <coughs> sites and, and primary forests. My question is, to what extent are you reaching out to learners and youth? Because my bet is the change is going to come from the new generation because they are uh, the ones who are most vested. Uh, it's their future, uh, the sustainable future. And, 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 and the scientific, uh, as you are, uh, you know, as we have new emerging scientific uh, data, uh, while you deliver it to the policy makers, I think it would be equally important to translate that in a user-friendly way for schools and educators and youth so that they can become active global citizens and local citizens and make a difference on the ground. So I'd like to hear if there are any examples of that. Thank you. Exactly what we've been talking about today in our meeting, because um, um, you're absolutely right. Uh, we've, we've, the reason we've focused on the international policy space in particular is because the decisions that are made in the next two years will frame 
what happens to life on Earth. So there's new new framework and new targets for the Biodiversity Convention, nationally determined contributions have to be revised for climate to meet the climate targets by 2020. Um, the Sustainable Development Goal on land is being revised in 2020 so that with our limited resources we're focusing a lot on those high level issues. But you're absolutely correct and uh, we've been discussing today how we develop communication materials, education materials for the young and particularly given um, the really truly inspiring um, rebellion, if you like, of, of school children around the planet actually trying to claim their future, which is um, fantastically inspiring for those of us who lived through the 60s to see that we now have a generation <laughs> doing the same thing. So, um, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to answer that better for you next time we come to Woods Hole and meet. <laughs> but, you know, uh, if you please come and talk to us. We're really, I mean, this is a... Uh, we need uh, educators and, you know, and, and, and communication people to be helping us um, craft these messages. Of course, you know, I've spent a long time studying the science. I can give you a very good lecture about, um, the, about how we under can model the uh, lifetime of the airborne fraction of a pulse of CO2 in the atmosphere. But, you know, um, translating that to something that will inspire and can be used by uh, a youth activist, I'm clueless about. Good, yeah. I have a question about the uh, indigenous rainforest yeah. people in Brazil, the group with the yeah. South Korea-sized region. Um, can you tell me what their population is and is that population growing? Uh, yeah, their population today is around uh, possibly 9,000. So in a country, in a, in a forest area the size of South Korea. Um, it is growing uh, pretty rapidly, but you know, it's still tiny compared to the size of their area. And in fact, we, you know, we've even done some studies and stuff. Obviously, they're hunting and fishing and so on for their subsistence. But this area of theirs is uh, a real refuge for, for threatened and endangered Amazonian species because they just have, s the, you know, there's so much land that they're the areas they hunt are, are tiny compared to the areas that you know they're not hunted, but the uh, I was going to say their population is growing, but it also went through the classic, you know, decimation from introduced diseases when they were contacted, which was only in the 1950s and 1960s. Mm. So, wow. like my age group, um, in my parents' age group, went through that uh, epidemics. I think it was measles and chickenpox mostly, and you know. They were literally decimated. So probably, you know, almost ninety percent of the population died. So, um, but their population is growing, but it's still, you know, still pretty small. Mm -hmm. A quick question for the, um, uh, the Australians. We were just in New Zealand on a, on a, a okay. trip, and every port we stopped in, there were tons and tons and tons of logs being loaded onto ships. And when I asked, a couple of times I asked, everybody said, oh, it's all sustainable and all of that. Sure. And, I, and, and I, I'm, I'm skeptical. So what's the truth of this? Uh, this is, th in, in Australia, um, you know, the uh, basically our, so our, our natural forests are, are dominated by um, species of the eucalyptus genus, like the one I showed you. That's eucalyptus regnans. So they're all slow growing, long lived hardwoods. Um, that live up to, those trees live up to four or five hundred years. Uh, and, uh, you know, basically the, the forestry that's going on is mining. I would, I would describe it as forest mining because it, they're, they're not even sustaining the wood yield, right? Even if you were to find sustainability just in pure um, wood yield terms, it's not sustainable. There isn't a single forestry operation in the country which has been proven to be, to be sustainable. What they keep doing is changing the product that they're harvesting from it. So they went from harvest, harvesting the trees for lumber to harvesting for, for, for um, pulp to turn into manufactured wood products to now they want to go down, you know, generating pellets to export for power plants. Or well, whole logs you know. are actually sent and to. The New Zealanders are doing what? Well, the New Zealand um, 
and uh, you know basically deforested the whole you know, 90% of the country just got deforested. They had remnant patches of native forest of primary forest, so they put a moratorium on logging that and made a, a massive investments into plantations, a lot of monoculture plantations. So they're, they're logging it. They don't log native forests. They've hardly got any left whatsoever that's protected and all their timber's coming from plantations. Australia actually it, it has 85% uh, of its wood products come from plantations which is about 6% of the for, uh, forest cover. Plantation is an incredibly effective way, efficient way of supplying timber. 85% of our wood supply comes from plantations. There's, there's, there, there's no reason to log another, you know, ever log another native forest you know, again from a wood supply point of view. The problem they have in Australia is there's no money being invested in manufacturing. Right? So there's like, they've got, got, they got this oversupply of logs actually, which they're, they're, they're exporting whole logs plantation timber because people aren't in, they can't attract the investment you know to manufacture them in, into products that people want to buy so the the uh, logging of the native forest that's going on which I'm suggesting is more accurately described as mining uh, is, is just kind of a legacy issue you know it's just the it's the legacy it's the vested interest it's 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 heavily, the, subsidized. It's heavily subsidized you know it's all the all the reasons that uh, industry gets embedded in a in an economy and an, and uh, and it's kind of, you know, these policy dependencies that, that, that get it locked in. It's like the coal industry, you know, where you've got all this money invested in a certain kind of form of economic, economic activity that no longer makes any environmental or economic or social sense. It's yeah. worse than that, though, because we've got our production forests now, natural forests in collapse, the ecosystem, uh, the, in fact, the Central Highlands forests that um, Brendan showed you, even in ecosystem. Um, <coughs> just complete overuse and the interaction of logging, logging making the forest more fire prone and then the climate, the climate changes that are already occurring, that's catastrophic. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, a quick point on the logging is that if you look at, as Brendan said, only about a third of the planet, so the, the planet had about six billion hectares of forest, we're down to four, so we've lost about a third of the planet's forest cover. Of that remaining 4 billion hectares, about 70% we said was in plantations, and only about a third of that is primary forest or old growth forest. So we're down to you know, a small fraction of the original primary forest, and only a smaller fraction of that is actually protected. Um, from the boreal forest, which stretches from Alaska to Quebec and basically from Norway to, to Kamchatka, is only about a third primary forest. And so you think about the scale of that forest and how, how little old growth is left. Temperate forests that you find you know, in, in, in Europe and in North America were down to about 15% old growth at most. Uh, tropics, it's about 25%. Um, so what we found is that, in fact, when we've demonstrated this conclusively in the tropics, you can't log sustainably in the tropics because the trees grow back too slowly. That's probably true for old growth forests everywhere. You can't replace a 600-year-old tree on the, you know, 60 year rotation. 60 or 100 year <laughs> rotation, it just doesn't work. Um, so it, it's just, um, there's just been this myth that we're going to solve this problem by logging better. And um, that A, doesn't work, and it's a terrible approach for saving the diversity of life on Earth and from a climate standpoint. I just read probably too anthropomorphizing for scientists, but the hidden life of trees. Yeah. And, and he, really makes you appreciate how important old growth forests are because they just, you can't replace them maybe over hundreds of years, but they just had a, have a whole ecosystem that, that they're involved in that is, is unique. Um, but my question is about economics. Um, I've been involved in the center long enough to hear lots of discussions about red and, um, and trying to make it economically feasible for people to choose forests over destroying forests? And are there examples of where that's being successful? Or, or could you just comment on that approach? Because we all know that we see it in our own country when there's enough pressure, a lot of these protected places tend to get unprotected. Yeah, so just for the benefit who, of those who aren't familiar with, that, with the acronym, <coughs> Red stands for reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation, and it's an international program, or well, formally the formal UN Red Program. Um, the, the idea is to give finance, you know, to give to to pay countries not to 
log their forests, um, or that was the original idea. You would basically pay countries to protect their forests so that the emissions wouldn't occur. But that's not how it ended up panning out. But Virginia, uh, uh, when she interrupted Glenn's introduction, because he said that uh, she worked for Forest Alive, she used to work for Forest Alive, um, which was a carbon offsetting um, business. So I might, I might let you uh, answer that question about what's happened to RED. RED was intentionally designed to give payments to protect forests. So what, how has it panned out? Um, some people argue that RED has never been implemented. Um, it rapidly turned into something that w became a subsidy for logging primary forests in a nicer way than they might otherwise have been logged. So the argument was, um, you know, it costs money to log nicely and there will be fewer emissions than if they're illegally logged. Um, that may or may not be accurate, but in fact it, it appears to have turned into a subsidy to actually encourage logging rather than protection. There are some examples of where RED has actually helped protect forests, but they're very few and they really are the minority. Um, the program now has shifted again so that um, results-based payments are there, as they're called, will be given to countries that meet certain criteria um, against their overall what's called a forest reference level of their emissions from forestry. Um, already we're seeing the sort of um, uh, weird and wonderful um, gaming, I gaming think the of the system um, to artificially inflate forest reference levels that in fact will result in no net reduction in the destruction of um, primary forest. Perhaps the most um, perverse outcome of all is that in the forest arena, in the climate arena on forest, there is no differentiation between a primary forest, a secondary or degraded natural forest and a planted forest, a monoculture. That is a catastrophe. It means that when people are working out how they're, how they're travelling on their forest emissions, they can net out the loss of primary forests from planting new monocultures of trees. And the two are in no way comparable. One, the plantation certainly can't replace in any way either the, the size or the stability, um, let alone the biodiversity component of a primary forest. So there are all sorts of weird and one, they almost sound you know, impossible to an educated lay audience. How can these perverse things happen? And the answer sadly largely is the power of, the, of timber interests. Logging interests r essentially wrote the rules for the Kyoto signatories, for the developed countries, and they are being transposed now to the developing world. Um, these are some of the things we're attempting to deal with in the climate <laughs> negotiations. All the attention goes to fossil fuels, but in fact it's critically important we get much more attention to the fate of the world's forests to protect the best of what we've got left and uh, do far more rational things <laughs> for, for nature and for the climate than we're currently doing with our forests. Yeah. And I think, you know, we were talking about this today about the transaction costs of, uh, involved with the RED scheme. So at a small scale, I can give you some money and, you know, um, the risk is quite low because I'm not giving you much money. But if we're talking about billions of dollars, distributing billions of dollars at a national level, specifically to get some outcomes related to you know, carbon emissions concerning how forests are managed, then that invokes a whole suite of issues and mechanisms and, there's very, and it's very expensive to, to deal with them in any way. Everyone at every level has to have the capacity to be able to monitor and evaluate and measure and report, et cetera, et cetera. So you get these, it becomes an enormously expensive what started off as a simple idea ends up being very complicated and expensive and for all of these kind of reasons we're not actually seeing the money flowing and the results happening you know, as originally, originally so hoped. Kind of and, and yeah. And how to get the money to the right people. That's right. So that's all the transaction costs. How do you put in place all the processes and me mechanisms and safeguards to make sure you get the outcomes? That's really expensive.
Thanks so much. I mean, these are fascinating vignettes about a very complex issue. And I think, you know, we've all heard there are, there are cautionary tales here, but there are also many reasons for hope. And, um, you know, thanks so much for your attention to these issues and, uh, you know, keep the flag flying for primary forests. So thanks very much.